Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our two presenters, Jean Fermans, who works at Finastra as business development and solution expert. Jean is based in New Jersey and has more than 20 years of experience in the banking industry. We also have Sebastian Aldeco, who's the subject matter expert at NetGuardians. Sebastian has over 20 years of experience in fraud and compliance technologies. Let me quickly go over the agenda now. Jean will discuss SWIFT-related use cases, Finastro's customer security program and service bureau solution. After his presentation, Sebastian will discuss NetGuardian's approach to fraud prevention, how we use AI to prevent fraud and overcome challenges in this space. He will then show you the demo. After that, we will have time for questions and answers. Before I pass it on to Jean, let me quickly introduce NetGuardians to you. NetGuardians is a Swiss company, so our headquarters is in Switzerland. Our regional head office is in Singapore. We do have offices in Germany, Kenya, and Poland as well. We have over 90 employees today and more than 60 customers globally. We do work very closely with our partners. We have global partners, we have regional partners, as well as local partners. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jean. All yours, Jean. Well, thank you, uh, Shabana, and um, thank you for uh, the invitation uh, to speaking to your, um, um, you know, invitees. So maybe we can go to the next slide. And the next slide is actually an introduction to, uh, you know, the, the customer security uh, uh, program uh, developed by SWIFT. In other words, a CSP. For those who are using uh, SWIFT, you know that you have to do, or up till now, to do a self-assessment. Uh, if not, uh, as of this year and the years to come, it will have to be either an independent internal organization um, or um, external uh, third party. Uh, that will help you with that self-assessment. Uh, but before, uh, you know, SWIFT came up with uh, the CSP and a number of recommendations, we can go to the next slide. Um, there were some some uh, cases or uh, incidents, uh, let's say, you know, the market before they really came up with that, that uh, program. And it all started in Bangladesh, but, um, you know, before that there were fraud cases as well, but obviously uh, this was, uh, highly uh, publicized, so obviously highly publicized because of the, uh, you know, amount that's been defrauded by, um, you know, um, from, from uh, the central bank of uh, Bangladesh. So the initial uh, attempt or the initial uh, or the objective was to defraud uh, $1 billion and they were only taking, a, they were only successful in taking away $81 million. Still a good price, but obviously far away from $1 billion. But how did that all happen? And uh, so the next slide will show, you know, what what actually, you know, happened, uh, you know, gra uh, gradually. Um, so uh, attackers or hackers or fraudsters, you know, they're looking at vulnerabilities and they, you know, they're looking for targets. And in this case, you know, unfortunately it was the Central Bank of Bangladesh. And by doing so, uh, they start to penetrate the uh, the infrastructure, the environment by placing malware, and that malware actually um, does some reconnaissance uh, of your uh, traffic, uh, what is happening with transactions, uh, beneficiaries, amounts, uh, uh, traffic uh, or payment patterns, and uh, so on. So once once that information has become available over a a, a, you know, a given um, a period of time, um, what they did is actually used the uh, Swift Alliance middleware, the messaging interface, to create those transactions, those those transfers. So they were not um, the transactions were not created in the core banking uh, system, uh, but actually on the middleware, uh, where actually the um, you know, uh, where, uh, where it is very or most of, uh, vulnerable, um, although there are controls, but uh, still most uh, vulnerable. Um, they did not wire just one transaction of one billion. No, they 
really split it up over, um, you know, apparently 35 transactions. And now what happened, you know, some of them uh, went straight through without, you know, special uh, authorization or the authorizations were built in, so they went straight through and some others they failed. And for example, one, one reason why, uh, you know, transaction or a number of transactions failed was because of the, you know, uh, beneficiary account uh, was incorrect and therefore, you know, some investigation needed to be done and then someone uh, the next day actually, or maybe two, probably two days later, you know, found that it was a fraudulent, um, you know, payment. Um, why I say uh, two days? Because uh, it was done over a public or a backing uh, holiday. So they really... Uh, choose their timing as well to send to those uh, transactions. Uh, they were able to uh, delete uh, uh, the, the, the traces or the other trails within the middleware and even um, on, on other reports that were uh, produced through the uh, middleware uh, system. So it was very, uh, very, um, you know, sophisticated uh, and they knew exactly what uh, what they were doing. and. So Bangladesh, and we will see on the next slide, that Bangladesh obviously uh, is not the only uh, case. It's uh, highly publicized. Uh, there are some other cases, as, as uh, we will see. Can we go to the next slide, uh, please? Or I haven't seen the next slide uh, yet. Um, so there are a number of uh, other, um, you know, transactions that... Uh, Uh, that have been uh, published. I do not see the the, the, the next slide. Okay, fine. So um, there are many more. Uh, thank you. Yeah, we can stay there. Uh, there are many more of those uh, transactions or fraudulent uh, payments, but not everybody, you know, goes to the press or the press do not necessarily, you know, know about them. And so, uh, so now uh, coming back to the CSP, the cust the customer uh, security program. Uh, is based on the uh, eight uh, principles. And the first four, when you use a service bureau, uh, that's on us. So when you use the Finestra service bureau, that is on us. That's what we do. We provide, operate, and manage a secure uh, SWIFT environment. And with that, we are providing the messaging interface. And with the messaging interface, uh, you know, it uh, provides, it comes with uh, a, a rule-based uh, engine or tools. Uh, for example, obviously you have your users, you have the permissions, uh, you have um, the workflow, and you have um, you know authorizations. And those authorizations are rule-based. For example, if a transaction is over ten thousand dollars, a million dollars, then obviously you know someone else or someone else uh, you know maybe four or six eyes. Uh, are, are required to authorize a transaction. Uh, maybe it's uh, only in uh, US dollars or maybe in another currency. So this is all rule-based and it's very static. What SWIFT has now done on top of that is like, you know what, you also have to understand the behavior and the patterns of your uh, payment transactions. Uh, and that's a, high, a highly recommended, um, you know, addition to what you already have in place. And therefore, uh, in order to do that, uh, fraud prevention and detection by net guardians come into, um, you know, come into play. And the reason why we looked into that, or we are happy to work with our net guardians because uh, it is uh, using AI, so, uh, so artificial intelligence that actually looks at the history of your transactions uh, creates patterns or understand the patterns and then create risk profiles. And whenever a new transaction comes through, it will uh, screen or scan against the, the, the uh, profile, or the risk profiles. And when there's an uh, anomaly or uh, something is, uh, you know, outside, you know, the behavior, the normal behavior, then NetGuardians uh, will be able to highlight that and then, you know, bring it to your attention. So can we go to the next slide? I believe the next slide is just uh, to say that the first four, uh, you know, principles um, is uh, based, so when you use a service bureau, uh, that is on us. Uh, I don't see the next slide yet. Maybe it is coming. Yeah. 
Jean Financial Service Bureau yeah. slide. It's there. Uh, okay, so now I see the architecture type. That's just to say, you know what, everything is on us. These are the four principles. But you can go to uh, the Service Bureau slide in the Finestra Service Bureau. If you have it, that's fine. I don't see it yet, so I assume uh, there's some other people who are not uh, seeing it uh, yet. Um, but just as an introduction, as a SWIFT uh, you know, service bureau, we are certified. Finestra operates a number of service bureaus um, across uh, geo uh, geographical uh, regions. And um, so obviously it's a SWIFT uh, environment, and here we see it. With that SWIFT environment, we are certified. The messaging interface is certified. And we connect into SWIFT, but we also, uh, which is a global uh, banking network, uh, we also um, uh, added uh, the Ripple network, which is also a global uh, banking network. So if you have some questions or you're interested into uh, Ripple and into connecting uh, to Ripple, uh, please uh, uh, let us know, and we're more than happy to entertain that discussion. Um, so it is a whole environment completely operated and, and uh, managed by us. Uh, it serves or it um, supports all the SWIFT uh, services, FinFile, like Interact. Um, it comes with the rule base, and now left and right, as we see, we put barriers, and those barriers are provided by uh, NetGuardians. And yeah, we can go to the next uh, slide. And so when you happen to have uh, or use those um, uh, services, be it the corporate, be it the financial institution, when you go over SWIFT, you go over SWIFT, it is just a matter of, of uh, um, you know, applying uh, uh, or being a member of our SWIFT. If we go to the next uh, slide, maybe you see it, but I don't. Okay, uh, no, it's not yet. Uh, so, uh, yes, I believe we will be sharing out a slide. That was a question. Um, I still don't see the, um, the slide. Maybe let's be patient. But uh, basically, the uh, so the Net Guardian. So, yeah, so here it is. Um, sorry I fall for other delays. Um, so, Net Guardians is not only on, on the Swift Service Bureau, it is much more than that, and Sebastian will uh, talk about it. Um, so obviously we have fully integrated it in our platform, uh, but we, NetGuardians extends also within, you know, within the financial institution. If you look at the financial institution, yeah, we can stay at this slide, uh, into the financial institution and capture anywhere, whenever a transaction is uh, being generated, it can capture uh, that transaction and look at it at uh, the profiles uh, whether it comes from, you know, a branch or uh, internet banking or your phone, um, you, you know, the app on your phone and uh, so on. So it can really uh, look at those transactions and, and uh, correlate everything um, with your uh, mobile phone, for example, uh, whom you are, what you do, how much you send. Um, and so it's all profile-based. And uh, given that, so why Net Guardians? Because obviously there are other, uh, you know, providers as well. But we are happy to work with uh, Net Guardians. Um, first of all, because it was for us easy to integrate. So for our customer base, uh, client base, it was an easy, uh, you know, integration with our current, um, you know, environment with our current platform, uh, which obviously lower the uh, operational cost. Um, that's one thing. Uh, but what is important as a solution, it's uh, based on uh, artificial intelligence. So it is a learning tool. It's not just rule-based. It's not like, okay, this is what it is, and if you don't change anything, it's going to be forever like this. No, it is an ongoing learning, um, uh, learning, uh, or it has a learning capacity. So, so it, 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 it doesn't look at rules, it, it doesn't know rules, it looks at the behavior, it looks at patterns, it creates risk profiles, it will ad, uh, adapt those risk, uh, risk profiles. Um, and for us, for Finastra, uh, we believe it really enhanced our portfolio by we are already providing a payments workflow with permissions, rule-based uh, engines, and uh, so on. on. On top of that, we have duplicate detection. We provide sanction screening. And now 
as per CSP uh, recommendation. But, you know, these days I would say it's common sense. It's also, you know, for fraud prevention. And having said that, this is a nice uh, segue into NetGuardian. So I spoke why we are adopting a, a, adopting a NetGuardian, and we are happy to work uh, with the NetGuardian team. So I'll leave it to Sebastian to, uh, you know, talk about the uh, solution. Sebastian, over to you. Thank you, Jen. Um, hi, everybody. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is uh, I'm going to start with the difference between a rules-based approach and a specific artificial intelligence approach, and why a rules-based approach, which is something that probably you already had built in, in-house or with certain extra tools that uh, are there, um, there's gonna be, uh, they're going to be uh, ineffective uh, to detect SWIFT fraud cases. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please? Um, so this will be the look and feel and the usual implementation approach of a rules-based product. So what you're going to have is in a traditional rules-based fraud detection, what in NetGuardian we call generation one of fraud detection product, you have the fraudster. The fraudster commits a fraud, certain type of activity in order to procure money from someone else. There is a human analysis, that means uh, the um, customer of the bank will report that the money is missing or the bank itself or some entity will detect that it was a fraudulent activity. A rules will be created, the rules will be implemented, and then the, you have detection after that one. So obviously, this is an approach that has been around for a long time, and um, they have certain disadvantages. The main disadvantage is that it's purely a reactive approach. So you have to be attacked first by fraud, or you have to receive some intelligence from someone in order to be able to have, be secure and be covered for that. And uh, sadly, it does not cope with today's globalized world uh, for several reasons. Uh, time of the day, uh, level of activity, amount of transactions. There are many things why this is, used to work maybe 10, 15 years ago, but right now it's definitely not a good idea. And uh, the other problem that you have is it generates a lot of false positives. That is because you're going to have alert, uh, rules to, the, to alert about certain scenarios that generate false positives in other scenarios. If the rules are not constantly maintained and are not constantly um, fine-tuned, you will have a lot of false positives and you will need to create a new exception for the rule for any type of new activity which is valid. So this requires a lot of effort and is definitely not something that nowadays uh, is actually efficient as it should. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, how do we do it in NetGuardian? So how do we block fraudulent transactions in real time in NetGuardian? Can you go to the next one, please? So this is the way that NetGuardian approaches the situation. And you see it's a little different than what it was done in the rules-based approach. In the rules-based approach, you are focusing on the fraudster and you're looking for a fraudulent activity. In the, the artificial intelligence approach that we apply in NetGuardian, we focus on the client. And what we say the client is the customer who actually creates the, the transactions. That will be monetary transactions or it could be behavior. So both things will be captured by the specific uh, platform. Now, that, uh, those transactions and those behaviors will go through an analytics platform, so they will be profiled, and then it goes through our machine learning algorithm. And those are algorithms that we have created uh, ourselves uh, and that we have tested specifically to detect some transactional fraud. So we are not actually going to experiment, try to come up with a new algorithm checking your data. We already know what is around, and we already create algorithms that are good to go from day one. That, that machine learning will alert about anything and activity which may look abnormal. That will go to the detection step. The detection step will be a, in, a investigated by the fraud detection team, and they will make a decision. That decision of a fraudulent or false positive will be retrofit to the machine learning model in order to improve the efficiency. So opposite to the other approach, when you needed to modify a rule to, to do an exception and have a false positive, the constant detection and improvement implementation that you have in the machine learning model will actually gonna skip all the situation and the model will gonna keep, keep on learning, keep on adjusting and keep on predicting things that may go wrong. So that, that's why we analyze behavior with this approach. We identify the anomalies, but 
here is a question that usually come is how can it learn from viewing historical fraud cases? So what uh, the machine learning do and the analytics will do is gonna look at the historical data. But how can it learn? Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? All right, so here is a, a, a usual machine learning implementation. So machine learning implementations are not all the same. So if you, many companies in the world, many institutions claim that they're using machine learning, and they, it's true, they are, they are actually using it. But it has some several disadvantages. One of the main disadvantages that you have in, with machine learning, which is what happened initially when the machine learning was tried to be implemented to replace rules, was the concept of overfitting. Overfitting is when you actually have a machine learning model and you train the model to detect certain kind of fraud. So you use the knowledge from the past to actually train your AI model to detect fraud. When you have an overfitting problem, the situation that you have is that the model does only detect the fraud that you train them to detect. So you are not better than you were with rules. With a rules approach, you were actually detecting a fraud that you know. When you train the model purely for the fraud that you know, again, you're in the same situation. Can you move to the next slide, please? This is the way that uh, we do it different in Guardians. So uh, the problem that you have with AI with overfitting is purely using the concept of machine learning called supervised model. Supervised model is a model that you train to detect the fraud that you know. In NetGuardians, we use something called managed learning. We use the combination of supervised and unsupervised model. The unsupervised model is a model that will give us predictiveness about future fraud that may be detected. We don't use it in isolation. We use it with supervised model combined. So the combination of these two models, so the learning technologies that we actually implement together, they give us the, the fraud, they take the fraud that we know, the fraud that we have experienced that, ha that happens, and also adjust and predicts future fraud patterns. So here you have a situation of both, the best of both worlds, the predictiveness and the uh, learning from the past. And with that combination, we remove the overfitting. Can you move to the next slide, please? So uh, probably we're not gonna have time to do a full demo uh, in the, with the time that we have allocated here, but we can give you some uh, quick uh, slides of uh, how the look and feel of the of the of the system is, and then you have an idea how you're gonna do the investigation process. Can you move to the next slide, please? So this is our case management. This is how uh, the alerts of the transaction look like. Remember, when you get to this process, the SWIFT transaction has already been sent, has already been executed. The transaction has been sent to uh, the NetGuardians, NetGuardians platform. The NetGuardians platform has evaluated if the score uh, risk score is high or low and has already given an answer back to the Finastra uh, for banking product. That answer back may have been, in the big majority of the cases, everything is fine, this is good to go, or it could have been, watch out, there is something risky on this transaction. And then uh, the Finastra platform can decline the transaction, put a park on it, or hold it for until a certain time until the decision is made. When those transactions trigger an alert which is risky, those alerts will appear in this, in this screen. And this is what you see here. This is a list of transactions, which is different SWIFT transfer. Those transfers have different activity and they actually uh, trigger an alert. Can you move to the next slide, please? So when you review a transaction, when you go inside the details of the transactions, you're gonna see something like this. So on the top left side, you're gonna have the risk score from zero to 100. Uh, we will define with you what is transaction is risky and not risky. We have some guidelines there. This, is, this example is obviously a really bad transaction, has a 100% score, which means that it's most probably a fraudulent transaction. And when you have a transaction with this level of, of risk, most probably will be declining in real time. So you don't wanna let something like this go. What you're gonna have on the right side, it's the additional information that we found relevant for this specific transaction. So a quick snapshot of the activity that looks that is not right. And there's an investigate button there that we, I will show you how uh, it, what it does when you press it. Can we move to the next slide, please? So this is below the screen. So if you scroll down, you're gonna see this information. And this is the, probably the most important information in this page. Each one of the lines that you see here is a data point. It's a data characteristic. 
And the bar that you have on the right side, the percentage bar, the red and blue bars, are how unusual is this data characteristic compared to the history of this specific customer or this specific account? So in this case, for example, if you see the first characteristic, receiver bank account has a 99% score. That means that this person never sent money to this specific bank country before. That's why this characteristic is extremely unusual. The second one that you have there is the receiver bank country as well. You have the bank ID, you have the currency, you have the part of the day. All of them are above 90 something percent. That means that all those characteristics compared to the usual behavior of the customer of the owner of the account, they are extremely unusual. Again, this could be a valid transaction. It could be something that the person never, never has done before and that's why he's alerted. But the fact that he sent a, a money to a new bank in a currency that they never used before, at the time of the day that they never did it before, to a country that they never been, did, did it before, to a specific bank ID that they never did it before, the combination of all those abnormal characteristics make this score really high. And that makes this worthy of investigating. Below, you're gonna have another ones which are in blue that are the 60% the or below. Those are the characteristics that are there, but they are not unusual. Like for example, the day of the week is 5%. That means that this person, based on his historical pattern, tends to send money on this day of the week. Same thing for the transfer type, same thing for the um, course change his own, et cetera. So one of the main questions that we have and one of the main concerns that we have when we are talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence is, is this a black box? And this is the way that we provide explainability of what the machine learning model, model is doing. If anybody ask any auditor or any entity ask you why you are reviewing this transaction, you can clearly explain on this page, oh, we are evaluating this transaction because the model has detected that all these characteristics are unusual. And because they are unusual, that's why we are putting the score. Compared to a rules-based product, think about a, a rules-based, you will need a rule for the characteristic one, a rule for the characteristic two, a rule for the characteristic three, and so on. So you're gonna need a rule for each one of them. When you have a machine learning model, the model takes care of all the characteristics together and in one go, they give you all the data. That's why it's much easier to maintain. Can we please move to the next page, please? So this will be when, remember that there was a, below to the 100%, there was an investigate button. This is what you wanna see when you press that button. This button will drill deeper into the characteristic of this transaction compared to the profile of the customer. So there, is, there are a series of dashboards uh, that they will, we have several by default, but we can customize if you wanna see one in particular. I'm gonna focus on the most important ones. The, the thing that you have at the top, the line, is the transactional data. So it's the transaction that triggered the alert. What you have there is a, a 47,000, sorry, 473,000 transfer uh, in the currency Sierra Leone uh, to a country to Kenya. What you have on the, middle right, that is a, it looks like a, a, like a skin of a bone diagram, is the usual activity that this account has. So the account is the left side, the currency is on the middle, the country that is sending the money is on the next one, and the accounts who receive the money are on the right side. So the thicker the line, the more activity has to this specific account. What we're gonna be looking for unusual is the, la the last line, the CDF line, that is because there is not much activity here. So the more activity you see, the more profile you have into that activity, the thicker the line will be. And on the left side, the, you're gonna see what you have the, we call the radar diagram or the spider web diagram. This diagram has in each one of the edges of the radar has a data characteristic and you have a line. The closer the line is to the edge, the more unusual the characteristic is. So a characteristic like, for example, part of the day that you see on the top right is extremely unusual compared to the profile of this customer, but a characteristic like transfer type, which is the one in the middle, is almost in, actually on the center. So that means that the transfer type is not such an unusual characteristic. As a main guideline, the more colors you see here, the worse the transaction is. Can you move to the next slide, please? And here, you're gonna see uh, diagrams who are essentially each one of the characteristics compared to the profile. Again, this is to provide more explainability. So the way you read this is, uh, if you see at the pie chart on the right side, is the sender currency. 
So the descending, descending currency uh, has, on the right side, has certain scores. Uh, there is a final number there called partial score, which is in red, which is 0.8. What means that this specific currency, which is the first one, uh, first line that you see, that is SLL, Sierra Leone uh, dollars, sorry, Sierra Leone Leon is that currency, is the currency that these customers has used for this transaction. Now, the score is really close to one. Remember, the closer to one, the more unusual the data characteristic is. It's 0 0.84. That means that this person, compared to the historical data, they not send money in this currency most usually. The combination of all these unusual characteristics is what is actually put the score high. And then you can see on that pie chart which one are the other currencies that are the ones that this customer use more often. So it will be really easy for you to compare if this transaction is unusual or not, because you will be able to see all the historical information that this comes from. Can you move to the next slide, please? So these are different uh, um, uh, drilling deeper on these specific data points. So you have part of the day on the left side that it will tell you which part of the day is mostly used. If, it's, if this person trans, uh, tends to trust money on the mornings, on, on the afternoons, a week, a day of the week. This is an account that is actually used on weekends. This is an account that is used during weekdays, etc. So all the individual characteristics will have one of these diagrams, and you will be able to compare them uh, in more efficient uh, level um, why they are unusual. So it's an extension of the previous diagrams that we will show you. The previous diagram we will show only show you the percentage. This one goes deeper into that explanation and tells you why that percentage is so so high. Can you move to the next page, please? So, takeaways that uh, I would like to, to have uh, after this quick presentation. Uh, can you move to the next one, please? So, this is a, a business case that we had um, in Europe in a customer where we replace a rules based product. So, what happened is they used to have a rules based engine that was work, working there for several years. They were having the classic problems of a lot of false positives, identified, identifying certain type of fraud, but not as many as they would like. So what we did is we implemented the NetGuardian's artificial intelligence solution. And after a few months, this is the results that we got. The first thing that we did is we actually uh, um, reduced the number of block payments and false positives 83%. So this is because we actually removed all the false positives that they were having. So they actually uh, uh, didn't need to review as many things. So the workload and the amount of people that they need to review the same number of transactions was drastically reduced. Then, because we reduced so many false positives, the time saved for the investigator was 93%. So we actually, the fact that they didn't need to review as many things allows them to review focus and things that they were real alert. And as you see there, we have a 100% of detection rate of the fraud that they already knew about, but because we have a predictive engine, we detect 18% more of fraud. So we detect all the fraud that they knew about, and we introduce almost a 20% extra that they were not aware, reducing the false positive and reducing the, implement the, the reviewing time drastically. So this is the difference between having artificial intelligence and machine learning versus rules-based. The more rules you have, the more effort you need to do to maintain them, the more false positives you have, then you invest a lot of time and effort in investigation, and you don't have predictive. When you move to have machine learning and AI, you resolve the situation and you reduce all the numbers. Can we move to the next one, please? So, some key information. Uh, remember that uh, in, in order to obtain our solution, obviously you need to have a contract with Finastra. The system will be hosted and managed by Finastra. So what are we gonna do is this, uh, the NetGuardian solution will become a model for SWIFT fraud detection into the existing Finastra platform. Because of that, it's going to be a fast activation with on-site training providers. So we will actually show you how to run the product, how to execute it, how to do everything you have to do. And there's going to be an analog subscription and a low activation fee. So it's, this is going to be, because it's going to be a plugin, there's going to be an extra implementation there. Can you move to the next one, please? So, and just to talk a little bit more about the NetGuardian solution, this presentation is specifically about SWIFT, which is part of the, our enterprise payment fraud uh, com, uh, product, which is the one in the middle. But with this same platform, you can do other areas. You can do digital banking fraud, 
So you can actually detect, uh, use it to detect any type of fraud that is coming from your mobile banking or your uh, your uh, um, uh, your uh, home banking, or also to use internal fraud. This is a massive problem that we are facing in uh, the Asia Pacific region mostly. A lot of uh, branches who have employees who are not actually be as honest as they should. And because they know your regulations and they know your, your process, they can fly under the radar and they can actually start stealing money from you in the long term. So those components are actually also part of the Medgadens platform and you can have them. You don't need to have them all, but you can actually include them as part of the implementation if you prefer to. Can you move to the next one, please? Okay, so um, with that, the presentation is finished. I'm going to pass to Shavana to handle the Q&A section. Thank you, Sebastian and Jean, uh, for the presentation. Um, I found it really interesting, and I hope the audience learned something today as well. Um, so we have time now for the question and answer session. Please use your chat window to ask the questions. So here's the first question. Um, do you have AML solution that really that's on machine learning? Sebastian, do you want to take that question? Um, specifically, so something that you can do with the NetGuardian platform is there is um, you can potentially do AML with it, but it's not the main purpose of the solution. Uh, one of the main reasons uh, because of that is usually the, the money laundry uh, compliance, the AML compliance that you need to put in place are really specific depending on the country, and they are really specific depending on the type of things that you need to check. Because of that one, they are mostly rules-based things that you need to check in order to generate suspicious activity report. Said that, because the NetGuardian Solutions allows you to create rules, you could potentially include the AML checks as part of the, as part of the NetGuardian Solution, even when machine learning probably is not going to be the most uh, appropriate situation for detecting this type of transfer. Okay, thank you. Here's the next question. Do we see crimes such as the Bangladeshi bank heist happening elsewhere in the world? And there's a second part to this question. And has anything changed since that heist? So, yeah, well, we see more and more. They, they haven't actually made headline news like the uh, Bangladeshi one because that one was really big. We have seen it be, uh, becoming smarter. So the behavior of the Bangladeshi highs was trying to attack during a weekend when there was no activity and there was no human people present and then try to cash out as much money as possible during that breaking period. Now, what we are seeing now in the change of the model is because the fraudsters know that now people is ready for those exceptional days, they are trying to do a smaller theft, trying to blend those transactions between real transactions that are happening. So try to hide in plain sight. That is try to confuse behavioral patterns in order to make them believe that they are valid transactions where they are actually not. So instead of trying to do one massive heist and, heist and try to uh, steal as much money as possible in one go, just do a smaller heist, a smaller test, and try to blend them with no regular transactions. And that is uh, why certain AI models have really struggled to detect this type of transactions because they, uh, they really look like, like real ones. Okay. Thank you, Sebastian. Here's the next question. What would be the next steps to start using the solution? And how long would it take to get live? John, do you want to take that question? Sorry, what is the first part? How long? Um, what would be the next steps to start using the solution, and how long would it take? Yeah, so um, so obviously, I mean, uh, we're talking about the uh, you know total messaging platform. So we assume um, at that very moment, if someone approaches us, is using the total messaging platform. Um, there are a number of transactions that are already being pushed through. So the, the lead up to that, and that's very critical uh, for NetGuardians to build up their uh, profiles, the, uh, I mean the risk care profiles, is to have the ability uh, to look at historical uh, transactions. And obviously if it's an existing client that they've been using 
uh, let's say total messaging for one or two years, it's easy. You go back, uh, read read what what's what happened in the past, and then build up those risk profiles, and then um, then it's a matter of turning on that switch. Uh, if the historical data is not available, then obviously it's going to be a gradual uh, learning process, and that's going to be uh, slower. But I believe if, um, you know, let's say that uh, there is some historical uh, data, uh, this, this can easily be done within uh, two to three months uh, with a complete setup uh, and uh, being operational. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, Sebastian, did you want to add something to this question? Sorry, okay. I was in here. <laughs> Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah. So. so what uh, would be the next step to start using this solution and how so, long would it take? So um, usually what, uh, what we will do is, um, so after we actually have all the organization of the contract and all the wrapping up of the signatures, then um, we probably will organize uh, the configuration and training and we can, we can organize an, a, a meeting to have a design workshop and confirm that all your requirements are met. After that one, we can define the project scope and we can define how long the project implementation will be. Okay, thank you. So I guess we have time for one last question. How long does it take for the models to learn? Sebastian? Yes, so what we will do in order to, there are certain AI and machine learning solutions that you will need to go put them live and then you have to wait a certain amount of time until they are fully uh, trained and fully learned in order to make them effective. That's, that does not happen with the NetGuardian solution. What we will do with our product is we will actually ask you, once we define the data and all the swift messages that we're going to receive, to send us a backup of your historical data, uh, anything between six months to 12 months, and we will train the models with that historical data and those scenarios that you already have. With all that information, when we actually go live, the system will be ready to go from day one. So you don't have a warm up period and you don't have to wait until a certain time in order for the system to be fully productive. The, the system is fully productive since the moment that you go live. Okay, thank you. Sebastian, that's all the time we have for today's questions. Um, I do see that we have a few more questions that are not answered yet. Uh, we will provide answers to all the questions, even the ones answered already, and send those to you via email. If you didn't get the chance to ask your question, um, please feel free to send us an email, and we'll get back to you with the answers. In addition to the answers to the questions, uh, we will also send you the link to the recording as well. So thank you all for joining the session. Hope you have a great day.